And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Right. Father, I ask you now in Jesus' name, uh, your blessed word that you have given unto us today, and that you will let it resonate in our hearts and our minds, our spirits and our souls. Let your word set us free. Let your word captivate our very existence that we shall meet you in the midst of whatever it is that we're going through. In Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands and tell the Lord, thank you. Amen. Now, I want to give you real quickly, I want to try to bring you up to date real quickly. First of all, Jacob finds himself in a position because of a choice that he made. If you know the story of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who's the son of Abraham. Isaac had grown old, and Jacob had an older brother named Esau. And as Jacob had grown old, <clears throat> his eyesight had become dim. In other words, he was somewhat blind, but he could not see. And Jacob was a hairy little fellow. So what had happened is that the father would always lay hands on the older son and the older son will inherit the blessings of his father. Well, when Isaac had called for his sons, you all know the story, I won't even get off into all of it, but Jacob kind of did a little deception there. Kind of got the blessing in the front of his brother Esau. Well, Esau became angry. And Rebecca, who was the mother of both of these boys, uh, she was listening as Esau had became so frustrated until he had begun to speak out and said that he was going to kill Jacob. When Rebecca got the news, she went to Jacob and told Jacob what his brother Esau had planned in his heart. She told him, I want you to run away from this place and I'm sending you to my father and among my brothers. And there I want you to stay until he cooled down a little bit and this viciousness that's in his heart will leave. And then it will be safe for you to come back because Rebecca said, I just can't handle being torn twice. Once from what you have already done, Jacob, and now I can't stand to bear this with your brother Esau to, to be devastated by two of my children. And then she became a little bit more frustrated because she said, I want you to go to my brother. Do not choose a wife among the heathens or among Abraham's, but I want you to choose a wife among my brother's daughters. Now Esau was listening to all of these instructions that, that knew that his dad would not want them to marry outside of what the plans were. So what Esau had set out to do was deceive his dad. He, he couldn't wait to go and matter of fact, he went and took him wives of what he knew his daddy was against. But we're talking about Jacob. So here it is, Jacob runs away and he went to a place called Luz, L-U-Z, to hang out there. But how many of you know that in spite of everything that we go through, Jesus made us a promise. He said, Lord, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. Even when you are going through your trials, and your tribulations, you got to remember the promise that Jesus made that he would always be with you. Don't care if friends turn back away from you, family forsake you, Jesus would never leave you nor forsake you. 
this is the promise that God made to Jacob. So Jacob had went out from Beersheba and he went to a Haran. That's up in verse 10. Uh, and then he, he looked while he was tarrying there all night and he was tired. And Jacob took some stones and made him a pillow and went to sleep. Now this when some things begin to happen, how many know that God can still speak to you while you sleep? God will speak to us through dreams. And, and some of our dreams, you take my eyes down a little bit or maybe the mains. Our dreams sometimes that uh, will captivate us. Have you ever been in a dream and it seems like it's, it's happening in real life and you are right there in it? God deals with us even in dreams. So now when Jacob woke up and said in these words because he had an encounter and, and what he had in his dream was a ladder that went from earth to heaven. Yeah, yeah. And, and he said in his dream angels were descending meaning coming down and they were up, up, up ascending. So they was coming down from heaven and going to earth and from earth back up to heaven. That's all Jacob saw. But then he says, and at the top of the ladder, I saw God. Now, God had made him a promise. If you look back in verse 15, he says, I am with thee and will keep thee. Because see, God made a promise. It's called the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob promise. God say to Abraham, whoever bless you, I'll bless them. Whoever curse you, I'll curse them. Those promises handed down to his son and to his son's son. That's how we get the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham was Isaac's father and Isaac was Jacob's father. Watch this. God say, because of you, Abraham, every nation on this earth shall be blessed. We're under the Abrahamic covenant. See, when God makes a covenant, he cannot break it. His covenant is never broken. You may say, well, Bishop, if his covering, if his covenant is never broken, then why I don't see everything that God promised through his covenant? See, we are covenant breakers. Because if you read the word and understand it, everything God did, it came with it comes with conditions. As long as you stay in the will of God, as long as you follow God, as long as you obey God, God will release the Abrahamic covenant in your life. But when we walk out of and away from God, we can't expect to take God's blessings with us. Amen. So now watch this. When Jacob woke up, after he had this dream, he woke up. And if you read in the 28th chapter, up around verse uh, 11, he said, And he uh, lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set, so he didn't want to travel that night. And he took uh, the stones of that place. And put them for his pillow. And lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. And behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold the Lord stood above it and said. Look what the Lord said unto Jacob. I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father. And the God of Isaac the land whereof thou liest to thee. I will give it in to thy seed. So I'm going to give it. Now, watch this. Abraham had grandchildren. Y'all understand? Y'all with me? But you never hear God refer to any of his blessings to grandchildren because God don't have grandchildren. God have children. So we may be grandchildren of, of our grandfathers and grandmothers, but to God, we are all his children. 
equality of God's blessings. So watch this what he says. He says, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. The land whereof thou last to thee I will give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. He spoke these same things to Abraham. Shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now God said these same things to Abraham. That he's speaking to Jacob. And behold, look what he says in verse 15. I'm with thee. Now, number one, in verse 13, God told him that I'm with thee. I'm Abraham's God. In verse 15, he says, I'm with thee. And watch this here. Not only is God with us as he was with Jacob, but he says, I will keep thee. So it is God who is keeping us. And look what he says. I will keep thee in all places, wherever you go. Saints, can I submit to you this morning that makes no difference where we go, God is keeping us. I don't care where you go, God is keeping us. Because if God was not keeping us, in some of the places that we went in life, the devil would have killed us. But because God is keeping us, Look what he tells him. I'm still in verse 15. Not only will I do that, he says, all places where will I go and will bring thee again into this land. I don't care where you go, I'll bring you back to this land. What am I saying? Wherever we may travel in life away from God, God always has a way of bringing us right back to him. You know the Bible say, train up a child in the way that they go, that when they are old, what? See, that's why, and, and I don't want to touch on this, but I just want to say this, train up a child. See, if little Johnny is putting on his mama heels and having a purse and he's two years old and everybody laughed and you training him. So by the time he's 10, 11, 12 years old, and he's not acting like a man, but acting like a woman, it's because you train him. So you're supposed to correct those things while in between one and five years of age is a child's most devastating learning part. My grandbabies are like, uh, the, the two youngest, the twins, they're like 18 months. My mother taught them sign language. You know, when, 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 when London, when she walks, when you give her a piece of banana and she eat it, and she want more, she do this. That means more. You know, I didn't understand that. I'm like, what is she doing? What, what is and the wife saying? She's telling you she want more. They are smart and wise. But now look at what Jacob, God said, I'm going to be with you. And he said, your seed shall be blessed. All the families of the earth, everyone shout, I'm blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places. I'll bring you back again. I will not leave thee until, now this is part of love. God said, look, Jacob, I'm not going to leave you until I have done everything that I told you that I'm going to do for you. It's in verse 15. Right. He said, I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Excuse me, God has spoken some things that he says he's going to do for us. But we have given up on the dream and the hope and the promises of God because God may not be moving as fast as we want him to move. So because God is not moving as fast, we step and say, well, you know, he may not come when you want him, but he's on time. Again, I got to reflect back to the words Brother Dale said, is that God is not a God that has to travel because the travel and, and, and may not be there when you want him is to put God inside of time. God is outside of time. God is already, look, God has already sent his word of covenant that he made. It's us who have to make it to where his word is. If, 
he promised in his word that if you sit, I'll heal you. Then he, he, we're waiting on him to come by to heal us, but he has already sent his word. We have to make it to his word. Now everyone say, I have to make it. I have to make it. Now I'm going to share with you where it's at. I'm going to share with you where it's at. Now watch this here. He says in verse 16, and that's when Jacob woke up. Out of his sleep and says, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't even know it. That's dangerous. That's frightening. When God is present and we don't even know it. This is why when Moses stood before the burning bush in the mountain, God spoke to him through the burning bush, and all Moses saw was fire because God is represented as a consuming fire, but yet the bush was not consumed. And then God said, pull up the shoes for where you stand is holy ground. Now watch this here. It wasn't holy ground until God showed up. Wherever we acknowledge God, it becomes holy ground. In fact, this house is holy ground. The parking area, the grass, everything that's under the covenant of this church is holy ground. But now watch this. He said, I was afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God. We don't understand what the house of God represents. We think it's just a place for us just to come and have fellowship and, and, and then, you know, leave. But let me tell you something. It is some great things that goes on in the house of God. What makes it the house of God is not the sign. What makes it the house of God is not the cross or the pinnacle that we put on the building. What makes it the house of God is God says, I'll put my name on it. And once I put my name on it, guess what? All of his blessings is attached to his house. David said that the house of God is his place of refuge. Now watch this. <clears throat> what am I getting at? He says not only is it the house of God, but that last part he said is the gateway to hell. That cancels out, brother deacons, people that say, you don't have to go to church. Baby, let me tell you something. According to the Bible, the church house of God is the gateway to heaven. Look at verse, look at verse 17. That's what Jacob said when he acknowledged. And watch this here. At that moment, it wasn't even a building there. He took stones, poured some oil upon them, consecrated them, set them apart, and said this would be known as the house of God. It was changed. He called it Bethel. And even the city that was called Luz, it was changed to Bethel. Because Bethel means that this is the house of God. So watch this. Here, as I hit the middle portion of my message, was Jacob's new insight into God and into himself. People, we got to not only get the insight of God, but you got to get the insight of yourself. Right after God had finished speaking, Jacob woke up and was in God with a deep sense of God's presence. When was the last time that you felt the deep sense of God's presence? He now understood God as he never before. See, we can't just take what we know of God now. We have to go into the deepness of God's presence. For God had revealed his sovereign care for both his people and for Jacob. God was overseeing and taking care of all things including Jacob. In this, Jacob's desperate hour of need, Jacob was strengthened with new insight into God's presence and care. And let me tell you something. When you seek God, you'll find this. I want you to know the new insight that now flooded his heart and mind. Here it is. Number one, Jacob now knew that the Lord was present with him, brother. He felt the Lord's presence or not. See, we when we think 
because we don't feel his presence, God is not there. God is there. Whether you feel it or not, and this is what Jacob discovered, that whether I feel his presence or not, God is with me. Everyone shout, God is with me. And, and, and watch this as it goes on, that the Lord's presence was always with him in a very special way. We just saw that in Genesis 28 and 16. Since his flight from home, he had been gripped with fear, shame, loneliness, and he was now destitute. He had been suffering mentally and emotionally for days. How many of us suffered mentally and emotionally? And he was sensing great conviction of his sin because of the great wrong he had done against his father and his brother. He had been in the very depths of discouragement and despair. And we all sometimes become discouraged. <clears throat> we all sometimes have become desperate. Sometimes <clears throat> just life itself can discourage you. Sometimes when you feel that you should be here, but you're struggling and you're not even halfway there, you become discouraged. Sometimes you can get off focus and look at everyone else. Your marriage may not be going the way you feel it ought to go. Your relationship may not be where you want it to go. It will make you discouraged. When you look at your bills and then look at your income, it'll make you discouraged. <laughs> It'll put you in despair. So we all have that. But God had met him in his desperation and need. That's what we ought to shout faith. Because once you hit that point of desperation and need, that's what God meets you at. But here's the problem. Is when you feel your husband or your wife, your mama or your daddy is more to you than what God is, you miss the big picture. Because let me tell you something, I don't care if your daddy is Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, he cannot and his money cannot do for you what God can. See, when you are depending more on your husband than you're depending on God, you're in trouble. When you're depending more on your wife than you're depending on God, you're in trouble. When you're depending more on your parents than you're depending on God, you're in trouble because what you simply says is this. Your statement is, I have no confidence and no trust in God. I have confidence in this person or that person. It cancels out God's promises because God's promises are only activated in our lives when we depend on God. I love my wife, but I don't love her more than I love God. I love my children, but I don't love them more than I love God. See, I'll do for them, but I won't do for them more than what I do for God. See, because you have to understand when everything else fails, God is the only one that's going to stick by your side. Amen? Amen. It's been proven if you broke, people don't want to fool with you. But God will always love you. God has been by our side from day one. I hope you all are getting this because this, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm going to tell you something in a minute about the house of God. So now watch this here. God never will leave us. God will meet us in our desperation. God was present with him now and God will always be present with him protecting and meeting his needs. Not only does God be with us and not only does God protects us, but God meets our needs. You know, and you know what? In this day and time, he may not rain it down from heaven, but God has people that will do for you. Now this, this truth struck Jacob with new insight that he saw as never before that the Lord was always with him again, whether he felt it or not. Jacob sensed, number two, how awesome his experience had been with God. Bethel would always be a special place to him in Genesis 28 to 17. Jacob felt like we feel about the places where God has met us in special ways. I want you to think back to that special place where God met you in. Where was that special place? Where your desperate need, where you was running for your life, where you felt destituted, where you felt lonely because you know what they normally say? That a person never really meet God until they hit the lowest part of their life 
And once you hit the lowest part of your life, what you don't realize, you have had a dream and you have had an encounter with God because when you at the lowest part of your life, what else can you do but look up? And when you look up, you give it all to God. So where was your Bethel experience at? See, most people that may have been in the house of God, most people that probably was in your car, it was probably in the park where you just went and segregated yourself because you had nowhere to go because you were not in relationship with God so you couldn't make it to the house of God. Or sometimes like me, my life was destitute. But when I went to the house of God, is when I realized that God has always been with me. Even when we was out there in the world doing our things, sinning, and everything, God was with us. So now, when we first walk with God, we feel the presence of God, we feel the power of God. But as we walk with God, it seems as though God is no longer walking with us because we don't hear from Him like we used to. Well, you got to understand what God told Jacob. He said, I'm going to be with you always, but at this point, I'm going to be with you until I fulfill my promise. Not that God would leave Jacob. He just wasn't going to be as strong of a presence with Jacob, but he said, I'll always be with you, protecting you. Watch this. I'm almost done. Jacob felt like we feel. Here's a point. It was the very house of God. Everybody shout, it's the very house of God. A very special place where he could meet God in worship and in prayer. When we come to God's house, it is not to come to see what someone is wearing, to see who's going to show up, see who's not here, see what someone is driving. It, I mean, this foolishness takes place. When we come to the house of God, we are coming to God to meet God in worship and in prayer. Because you know what I've learned? Whatever I'm going through, through destitution, sickness, illness, disease, if I come with the frame of mind that I'm coming to the house of God, and if I get into worship and in prayer, God meets me in the midst of whatever I'm facing. And how many know when God meets you in the midst of what you're going through? He never lets you leave out the way you came into it. It was a very gate of heaven, he says. A very special place where we could ask. Now, now you know the Bible says, ask, seek, and knock. We've been asking people and not God. We've been seeking people and not God. We've been knocking on loan institutes and not help. The house of God is where it's at. That's why the Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Why? Because whatever I'm dealing with, if I can just make it to the house of God and get into worship and into prayer. Why? Because that's where you'll find God. You're not going to find God in mess. You're not going to find God in gossip. You're not going to find God in what people is wearing or what people is saying. You're going to find God in worship and in prayer. And when you find God in worship and in prayer, then you'll start seeing healing. You'll start seeing deliverance. You'll start seeing blessings. You'll start seeing being set free. You will experience these. This is what Jacob felt. Are you all getting this? So he says, where well, we can ask and seek and knock until God hear and answer our prayer. You know what I'm reminded of? When Elder Grisby was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, he kept coming to the house of God. He kept on asking God. He kept on seeking for it. He kept on knocking for it until God healed him. And that's what it's all about. I don't care what you're going through in life. You have to keep asking, seeking, and knocking. But it has to be in the house of God. Why? It's because when everything else and everybody else fails, there's nothing too hard for God. And that's why. Until 
mad at you. So what they get jealous at you? You ought to shout, I'm supposed to have. When they look at you and say, you should have been dead. No, I'm supposed to be alive. Why? Because God promised me. When they look at you and say, I don't know how you are making it with the income you have. You ought to be saying, I'm supposed to have this. with some 
because they didn't do construction. And I noticed that whenever the, the work went down, and he still was faced with his bills, but he didn't have no money. He didn't have nobody he could go and borrow it from. How many of you know someone you can go borrow your rent, your light, your gas, your water, your phone, and your groceries? You can go to them and say, I need all of this paid. Can you lend me the money? He had no one. His parents is deceased. So he couldn't go to mama. He couldn't go to daddy. It was just him. And he had two sons. But let me tell you what, what I observed that he would do. He would come to the house of God. When nobody was here, he would unlock this building. And I walked in one day, and he was kneeling down praying, pouring his heart out to God. He was in his Bethel place. Guess what? He didn't have to go sleep on the bridge, he didn't have to eat out of a trash can. Why? It's because you have to learn that when you hit into God's house, it is a place to worship, not complain. into his house in worship. I never forget my pastor. I used to always, when we would go into the church and nobody would be there, we would go there and he'd walk in. He would always say these words, Well, Lord, it's just me, O Isaac, thy humble and faithful servant. And you know, I understood, but I was like, it's kind of weird. It's like, with, if, if I walk into your house, I want you to know that I'm there. So I'm going to holler out, Brother Charles, it's me. I'm, I'm coming in. And so when he would unlock the door, so I find myself at times when I'm walking into the house of God, I say, well, Lord, it's just me, old Joe, your old faithful servant. And then I go to moving around and I realize I need to go before God. So I'm in God's house. I may stand back there. I may sit down or kneel and I'll just go to praying to God because I know that this is the house of God and his presence was here. And watch this here. We don't even know it because we think that God's presence is only in the midst on a Sunday morning when people are here. On a Wednesday night when people are here. Sometimes I just drive and just stop on the ground and just park and just talk to God. Why? Because this is the Bethel place. This is where God make dreams come true. This is where God give dreams to give directions. This is where God heals. This is where God delivers. This is where God set free. The next time you're going through and if the doors are not open, just kind of walk out on the property and say, God, here I am. This become your Bethel place. I'm almost done. I'm, almost, I, I'm trying to stay teaching, but I got a little excited. I, I, I know, I know what's going on at twelve. I know. So he dedicated. When have you dedicated this place as a place of worship? I'm not talking about corporately, but when have you done it? When have you said, Lord, I dedicate this place because I'm. Well, let, me, let me move on. Don't even worry about it. He built an altar. He anointed the altar with oil. He did it with stones. To be, to, to be, to, to a belief or pouring all upon a person or object has always been a symbol of dedication or consecration. You know, if you like sitting in a certain seat, it's okay. Yeah, I ain't got no problem. If you like sitting in that seat and you get that seat every Sunday because you hear, it's no problem taking the oil and just put on a chair and say, I got to anoint this place. Why? This is a very special place. Where I sit and meet and have a little counsel with God. Am I making sense to you? Jacob was dedicating the place to God as a very special place of worship. And let me tell you what we did when God first gave us this property. We went to the very end of it. And we stood there and we had communion. And we prayed. And when the slab was poured, we would come over here and pray. Some days I would just drive by and say, Lord, I know you're going to do it. I'm believing and trusting in you. Everybody was laughing. Everybody was talking about us. Everybody was putting us down. Everybody was saying, you know what? They done got stuck. They can't do it. But they didn't understand that this was the house of God. It was already dedicated. We were just waiting on God. So he named that place. The place Bethel, which means house of God in the verse 19. Note that the 
city loves, I told you about earlier, was nearby. And, and, and it was going to change to Bethel. Now this is what I told them Wednesday night as I close with this point. I don't know about you, but I want what Jacob had. That is to make God's house, this house. And you know what? I know it's there because when people walk in, they, they walk in and they'll, they'll wooze by not just to paint on the walls. Not because of the chairs, because you look at the chairs, they all the match. If you look at the town, it's all not straight. If you look at the walls, the walls are not straight. But when they walk in, they walk in and they lose. Why? Because something happened here. And it happened a long time ago. God gave me a vision, a dream. When we was in the storefront, and I looked over and saw the trees, and I said, you know what? There's the house of God. There's the place for battered women and children. There's the school. There's this place. And I went to calling it out, and one member said, Pastor, I don't see nothing but woods. But you know what? I had an encounter with God. Then he said, if you ask, I'll give it. So I start seeking, and I start asking. And every time I would ask the wrong person, the Holy Spirit would stop and say, I never told you to ask them to purchase nothing. If you say that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, why are you trying to buy what God already gave? So then I start having them encounters. The Holy Spirit say, tell the realtor, you want it. But you want it to be given to you. So I told the realtor, ask them when they give it to us for a thousand dollars an acre. Didn't have no money. The Holy Spirit said, why are you still trying to buy? I was being disobedient. But Lord help me. I had an encounter with God. And then when I got to that point, and one of the members say, Pastor, you say we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. I called them up and said, ask her would she give it to us. At that point, I thought I had lost my mind, asking for 5.74 acres. And the woman said, we've already promised it to all the school district. Y'all know the story. And 10 other churches have already inquired before you about the property. But how many of you know when God has a plan for your life, it makes no difference what goes on? So she said, well, Pastor Mays, let me ask you something. What do you want to do with the property? I had to go back and remember the dream and my Bethel experience. I had to tell her, the first thing God wants us to do is to build a house so that we can get out of the storefront and get on the property. And then we're going to build a shelter for battered women and children. Then we're going to build a school. She said, okay, but well, I just want you to know we've already promised it to them and it's 10 other churches. I said, but you know what? You can't give it to none of them because God has purpose for it. She said, well, okay, I understand. She was a Jewish woman. How many of you know months later I got a call? The Holy Spirit said, call. Check your voicemail. She called you. She said, Pastor Baines, do you still want the lady? Well, you know what? I've given the Dean School District enough time. And far as I'm concerned, the property belongs to you. It's yours. How do you want the title, the deed? We all know.
Let me tell you something. The food pantry is going every week, but what y'all don't understand, it ain't about the giving out the food. The reason why we invite them into the sanctuary now is not because we just want them to be comfortable. Most churches make them stand in lines. God told me, bring them in. And I know I probably went against what some, what some didn't think that was very ethical. But guess what? I listened to God. Even if it caused for me and you not to be friends or caused for you to leave, I have to listen to God. But let me tell you something. When you all alone, the there were people coming to me saying, Pastor Baines, I'm struggling with drugs. Can you pray for me? Can you pray for me and my sisters? I'm, 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 I'm running across people that they are meeting God in God's house. One mama came and she said, Pastor Baines, I need you to pray for this young man. They're getting ready to execute him tomorrow night. He's on death row and they're going to they execute him. Can you pray for him? Yes, I did. You know, I went against the odds of the food pantry saying you can't deal with people about church matters. Guess what? This is the house of God. And I'm not going to let no one dictate to me what I do for God. So rather if they take their food, I know God will make a way. Why? Because God made a way at one point we was giving out 100 to 150 turkeys every year. So then I asked everyone if they would just give me a moment to pray. And we prayed for that young man. And then guess what? Oh, glory. Y'all don't understand. When I sit at home that night, the news came on. I think his name was Anthony Smith. And when the news came on, they said, Anthony Smith, who was on death row to be executed tonight for killing, I don't know who it was, his stay has been granted. All I did was just sit there in my better place and say, thank you, Jesus. Why? Because God hears us when we pray. But you got to believe it. And it'll come. So I want people to experience the presence of God. People who never experienced the love, the power, and the peace of God would feel it the moment they walk in the door and declare that this is the house of God. Most people think the house of God is involved with people being jumping around all the time, that's good, and praising, that's good, but you know what? God is not bothered about that. Most people would take a message like this and say, you know what? Church was kind of dead today. The best thing we had going on was praise and worship. Did y'all notice that that was a little bit different this morning? We have to change the atmosphere. See, when I walk in, I want to, I know that God is here. And we all have problems and issues. And you know what? I don't need nobody. And look, please don't take this the wrong way. But I don't need you running up to me telling me about your problems. Because I have some too. That's just why we in Bethlehem. Let's just let God work them problems out. It's all right for you to come and say, Pastor, I'm going through. Because I've learned now, instead of trying to dictate to you what you ought to do, I'm going to say, you know what? When we meet God this morning, we'll both go before him on that. Yeah, we don't even have to talk about it. We'll just bring it before God. How many of you, can y'all understand what I'm saying? It's there, people of God. It's there. Is the house of God. Is the house of God. And that's all my desire is that when people come into this place, and you all should see the expression. When they walk in, they're never the same. They're looking, they just they just wolves. It's nothing about the color. It's because God's presence is here. And if you never see people standing up clapping and getting all excited. It does not mean that God's presence is not here. God's presence is here. Sometimes I just feel a sense of relief just to walk around on the outside. You all just try it. So sometimes through the week when no one is around, just come. And just walk around on the grounds. It is so peaceful. 
It is so beautiful. Sometimes I just come and just sit. Because I know God is here. And anytime you need help, God is here. Not saying that God is not everywhere, but this is the house of God. And that's what Jacob said. His presence was there and I didn't even know it. Because we're so used to everything moving. Stuff moving. And we say that's God. We think because of the loudness. When the Bible say he came in a still voice. God is here. Most people say, well, I won't even go before God because, you know, the music is not loud enough and the people are not screaming. You know what? God is not enlightened by that because, you know, he said in his word, he said, you know what? The people praise me and all of that with their hands and their lips, but their hearts. It's far from me. God wants our hearts to be right there. See, but right now, God is dealing with, 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 with all of us. But some of you all, you know who I'm talking to. God is really dealing with you. He's touching you. And you know what? People don't miss it. But your life is changing right now. Your life's going to change when you walk in this place. Because of the presence of God. And when you notice that, you notice the glory of God. It fills this temple. That's why we worship God, not for what he does, but because who he is. And I want you to be in a place where you don't have to worry about nothing. Just recognize. Just recognize. Stand to your feet all over the building. Those of you that's watching us by TV. We know that your life was blessed. And we're going to pray for you. And if you want to become a part of this ministry through sight of church. You may do so. Just follow the instructions on the screen. If you would like to give to financially support this ministry and this broadcast, you may give by clicking on the giving button. But most of all, what I want to challenge you to do is to give your life to Christ today. Let today become your better place when you meet God. We thank you. And we know that you did not tune in to this broadcast by accident. You tuned in because God wanted you to know that he's always with you. Let us pray for you now. Father, in Jesus' name. To those who are watching my TV, God, we thank you. I pray right now for that man or that woman who's watching. That their lives will be transformed. That they will find their better place. When they enter into your house, I pray that they will discover your presence. And God, that they know that you are always with them. May your blessings and your covenant and your promises overshadow their life. I pray for your mercy and your forgiveness over their sins and their iniquities. In Jesus' name, I pray for restoration. Those who may be suffering from illnesses or sickness, I pray that they be healed. All over this building, lift your hands. I'm not going to even call you to the altar. But God, because of your presence, we know that healing belongs to you. Heal cancer in the name of Jesus. Heal high blood pressure and diabetes in Jesus' name. Heal depression, destitution, deliver in the name of Jesus. We thank you right now, God. All over this place, God, your presence and your glory is in this place. Forgive us all of our sins. As we stand before you this day, we don't want our words just to be words. We don't want our hands just to be hands, but the words say lift up holy hands. And our hands we lift before you in this place. This place we worship you. This place is where your presence is. In the name of Jesus. To the man or that woman that's been praying to you for change, thank you. The deliverance has come. In Jesus' name. God, by the power of your word, your anointing, I declare now that every stronghold is destroyed. Every burden, every yoke is destroyed. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. We thank you. We never like to end a service without giving you an opportunity 
to be connected to the body of Christ. We do it by the way of saying, as the deacons come, the doors of the church is open. There may be somebody who may want to come. And I know that we, we have our offerings, but this is the first offering that we give God. If anyone would like to give their life to Christ, if you'd like to become a part of the body of Christ here at Heart of Faith, you may come forward to the altar. Come on, quick, 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 let's move. 